So in this video, I would like to give you an overview of what it actually is that we're doing. So far, we have been diving into filters, but to give you a bit of a broader picture, I'd like to get you, I'd like to make you aware of what motion queuing actually is at its core. So on one side, imagine there is a vehicle, it doesn't matter which vehicle, an aircraft, a race car, train, cruise ship, really doesn't matter. It also doesn't matter whether it's an actual vehicle or just a mathematical model of it. Your vehicle simulator is just a mathematical model. On the other hand, there's your motion rig and there are actuators. And now your plan might be to just use the data from the vehicle to drive the actuators. The problem is there's no set of data on the vehicle that would directly correlate to one of your actuators. So you can't use the data directly to drive your actuators. You have to take a little bit of a detour. And that detour goes through processing. First, you have to extract the data, then process it, which is just a way of saying do some math with it. And the results of that math are the lengths of your actuators. That's six numbers that define how long your actuators are supposed to be. That's really all it takes. Now, if you think of this as a one step process and you ask, well, what am I going to have to do in processing? What's that mathematical process? It's really hard to wrap your head around. Um, it makes much more sense if you think of it as a two step process. The first one will take the vehicle motion and turn it into platform motion. And the second one will take the platform motion and turn it into actuator motion. It's, it makes much more sense to think of it in these two distinct steps. The first one is filtering. We're deliberately filtering out some information from the vehicle and using the what's left to drive the platform. And once the platform is positioned in space, the next thing we're going to do is run it through an inverse kinematics algorithm and then determine how long the actuators have got to be in order to follow that trajectory of the platform. That is an incredibly fancy way of, of describing inverse kinematics what at its heart is just a little bit of linear algebra and it's almost so trivially simple that I'm not much in the mood of making a video about it because it's really really that simple it, it hardly fills a 10 minute video much more important is the first part turning vehicle motion into platform motion that is the part where I think many many people are struggling with because it's the least intuitive now when I say using data to drive the platform what exactly is the data that we're talking about on the vehicle? Well, here's an aircraft and it's got three axes, X, Y, Z. Doesn't matter how you call it. You can call it a longitudinal, lateral and vertical axis. And everything that happens on board that aircraft, everything that a person can feel, everything that describes the motion of this vehicle can be described as six numbers. The acceleration along the longitudinal, lateral and vertical axis of the aircraft and also the rotation rates around the aircraft's longitudinal, lateral and vertical axis. These six numbers completely describe all of the motion on the vehicle. Take a look. On the one side, there's the vehicle. On the other side, there's a platform. But we're not really taking all of the vehicle information. We're just taking six numbers. It's the angular rates around the longitudinal, vertical and lateral axis and the acceleration along the longitudinal, vertical and lateral axis. These six numbers pretty much define the motion of the vehicle. On the other hand, we have the platform with its six degrees of freedom. And ooh, surprise, surprise, six numbers, six degrees of freedom. While there's not a a direct one-to-one -one correlation, at least there's a logical connection. For example, the acceleration in the longitudinal direction. This is literally shouting at me that I'm supposed to use it for the surge axis. And the lateral acceleration, for example, for the sway axis or the angular rate around the longitudinal axis. This is almost a way of describing rho. Now, we can't use it one-to-one, -one, but at least there's six numbers here and six numbers here that have a very close correlation. On a side note, in my own software, Jamie, I'm using eight degrees of freedom. So the uh, tilt coordination and roll coordination channels, they get their own degrees of freedom. But that's a particular thing about my software. And as far as I know, in Mover, there's six degrees of freedom. And that, that'll work just fine for, for most cases. I'm using eight to, to mitigate some false cues, but that's a totally optional thing. So at its core, motion queuing is just the thing of turning six numbers into six other numbers. For now, just as a quick overview, keep in mind, it's a two step process. And the first step is the interesting one, turning vehicle motion into platform motion. How exactly we're going to do this will become clearer in the next video when we look at the different filters, some derivatives in the uh, translational or rotational space. And eventually we're going to come to the point where we're going to look at this diagram and we're going to answer the question, well, why are we using a double integration here and only a single integration here.